But today we are kicking off a new series, new place, new series. And I was going to start it last week, but since it was week one, it just didn't feel right, Jen. This is a four-week series over the gospel of John, my favorite gospel. Not to get confused with John's epistles. This is his gospel or account of Christ here on earth. And this series, this gospel is special to me because I, I feel like John had a very personal account of Jesus. And every, all the scriptures are written in a way that you could tell John was like right there. And I think as a Christian 2,000 some odd years later, it's really hard to feel like you're right there. It feels like, well, this is good. It's historical. It's data. But God's relationship with you is not to be data-driven. Otherwise, you could just be a Pharisee. God's, God's life for you was meant to be personal. And so until we can get that personal connection with Jesus, we never really can see what God's going to do in our life because that has to happen. That's part of transformation. And so John's gospel is very personal. It's very up close. This series is called Up Close and Personal. In this first week, we're going to look at a passage. It's three verses. If you go to John chapter 19, verse 25 through 27, and I got to tell you a funny story real quick. I was talking to a very seasoned pastor friend that is just amazing. And um, I was picking this. I like to pick, pick other pastors' brains on how they study, how they get inspired, and because you're always just looking to grow. Iron sharpens iron, and iron sharpens spoons. I'm a spoon and dull, and he can sharpen me. That's the, that's the plan. That's the prayer I, I always have. And, and, and um, so he says, he says, so what are you preaching this week? And this was a couple weeks ago. I'm like, what, you're going to put me on the spot? No, you don't want to, you don't know about that because I got to look at my spreadsheet and you don't even know how bad it is because, you know, I got a day job and I got a spreadsheet and people don't know I got a spreadsheet. They think I just walk around divine and I just know everything for the next year. And I forget, Jen, without looking at my spreadsheet, what's going on. That's how I keep track of things. So, so we start talking about this message and he just blew my mind. And uh, I just want to shout out Pastor Winfield because we, we were talking about these three verses and he just blew my mind with three verses. I saw it flat. He saw it 3D. He says, how does the text move? I said, that's a good question. So now when I read the text, I look at it more, how is the text moving? It's not just words on paper, that's flat to me. That's, that's schoolwork. This is, how does the text move in the situation? So I encourage you when you read to look at it that way, it'll bring the characters in the story to a three-dimensional view in your mind and it'll start giving you details that aren't even there. That's how God does it. So John chapter 19, verse 25 through 27, it says, Now there stood at the cross Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. A lot of Marys in the Bible. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, that's John. He's not conceited. He's just trying not to confuse everybody by talking himself like Bob Dole. He's referring to himself when he says the disciple whom Jesus loved, he's saying me as the writer. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom Jesus loved standing there, he said to his mother, woman, everybody say it together, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that moment, the disciple took her to his own home. He took her to his own home. Jesus entrusted something in them, not for later, not when Corona lets up, not when everything's good and an economy's good and everything's good and, and I got nothing better to do. Right then, Jesus said, now, behold, now. Tomorrow's no guarantee. Quit waiting, he says. John, I need you to do this now because tomorrow is no guarantee. And I was just thinking, like, wow, what a uh, scary and exciting moment for John and what a sad in strange moment for Mary, his mother. And if you think about the position they were all in as people in that moment when they got ready to change delegation because Jesus was going to the cross and now they were gonna swap responsibilities, it really blow your mind if you put yourself in the situation. And so it brought, it brought back my thought of when my oldest, how many thought Chloe did pretty good today? She sang, she's only 10. I mean, she's, she's like barely 10 and a half. And, and uh, um, we beat her when no one's looking. No, I'm kidding. She does a good job. We're very violent. No, I'm, I'm kidding. She is my first child. And the day she was born in the hospital, you know, when you have your first baby, there is a lot of fear 
as new parents because you don't really know anything. And thankfully, we have a really good grand, grandmother and, and papa and people that have experience and aunts and uncles. But as new parents, you're there with the nurse, robo nurse. I'll never forget her. She was so mean. She was the overnight nurse, Nicole. And they, they just never liked me. I think it's because I was like honest and transparent with them. Like, hey, how do you do this? Can you tell me how to swaddle, please? And they're like, why are you asking me? Why are you here? No, they didn't say that. But sometimes I thought like, are they, are they like, they don't, can I be here? Is it my child, right? Anyway, so, so the overnight nurse came in and um, I don't remember, was it Chloe the swaddle or was that Caleb? I, I kind of got into it with every nurse, every child. So uh, we, will, we just won't go there. But what I will tell you <laughs> is that there was a fear in me and Michelle with that first child, because right then we had all the nurses help, the people come in, they make sure the baby's eating, or they make sure the baby's eyes are okay, they make sure the baby's not too yellow, jaundice, all those things, they gotta put them under the lamp, all the things, and then in three days they say, we're gonna wheel you out to your car, and dad, you're gonna go get the car, and for security, you can't touch the baby, mommy's gotta take it in her lap, and when you get to the car, bam, cut the cord, you're on your own, see you wouldn't wanna be you. That's just went through my head. I thought, they're only gonna give us two and a half days Two and a half days, Damon, to, to, to figure this out, and then we're on our own? It was scary. And that was with a baby. And thank God for mother's intuition, because mother's intuition is driving the ship, let me just say. But with Jesus standing at the cross, behold, this is what you're going to do, Vincent. Behold, your mother, Jesus' mother, ooh, I don't know if I can go there. I don't know if I can handle it. And behold, your son. And she's like, but you're my son. You're my son. So there was a swap of authority, and, and it had to be a little bit intimidating. So as we kick off this new series, we're going to look at John and his relationship with Jesus through his gospel. And John shows us that a life given to Christ in exchange for the ransom that he paid on the cross for our sins is more than a gesture. Everybody say together, it is personal. It's personal, man. You mess with Jesus, you mess with me. You mess with my mama, you mess with me. You mess with my brother, you mess with me. Even though we fight all the time growing up, but we mess with us, the outside world, we're there. We were there to protect each other. It's personal. It's personal. I think a white man can't jump. Remember that movie? All the your mama jokes? It was, man, you say something about someone's mother, you're asking for it. It's just like, it's instinct. It's personal. John shows us that it's more than studying what God did and continues to do from afar, but it's up close. It's up close. He was standing at the cross, up close. Jesus was taking his last breath. This man who's writing this text was standing there with Jesus. I mean, really, it's, you can't, we can't relate. How can we connect to that? God says you can connect to it. Meditate on my word. I'll give you the the increase, the revelation. So, so we want to go there in our minds as John was up close. And that's how we are to be, up close. It matters that you not only hear God when he speaks to you, but incorporate. Everybody say incorporate it into everything. Not just Sunday, everything you do. Because just as the flesh in Christ mirrored the image of the spirit that dwelt in him, so are we as servants of the highest, walking in the name that we proclaim to save the lost, Jesus, living out his will here on earth as it is in heaven. That's a big task. That's what you've been tasked with. If you call yourself the body of Christ, that's what you have been tasked with. I didn't know that when I went to church the first time. Oh, I don't know if I want to do that, Larry. I don't know. I don't know. I'd rather just go get my high five, and go home, and keep living the way I'm living. It's easier. It's familiar. But God says, to whom much is given, much is required. And if I give you a lot and you want to be blessed, trust me, I'll help you carry the weight. So that's the body. That's what the body of Christ is to do. So we want to incorporate that firsthand experience in today's world. I mean, can you imagine what would, what would it have been like standing there? What the temperature felt like? What the breeze felt like? Was there any raindrops yet? You know, like was there storm? Like what was going on? I mean, I know it, it's the, I know John says enough was written that the world couldn't contain all the books if we wrote everything. So there was probably other, that's the last verse of John. So I know that there was probably other things going on that we don't know about. But God says, I give you enough. If you can take yourself there, I'll give you more. For it is unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. He told them. But can you imagine? 
as he's gasping, he's got thorns in his head. He's sinking on the cross. As his weight sinks, his air gets less, and he's still delegating to me. He still cares enough in that moment to think of me, to think of you. He's got, he's got a lot on his plate. He's struggling just to breathe. You think corona's bad. It is bad. But crucifixion is worse. And he still put us first. First. These are how the days should be ahead of you when I'm gone, is what he's saying to Mary and John. The title of today's first week is Taken to Heart. Because I believe that John took to heart what Christ left him with. You know why? Because he trusted Jesus. He had been with them for, you know, three and a half years or whatever it was, and he trusted Jesus. So when Jesus said, do this in my absence, John says, I will do it because I trust you and I I respect you. And that's how it's supposed to be for us. God's love was meant to be taken somewhere, and that's here, taken to heart. We can quote scripture all day, but if we're nasty with our neighbor, we got a problem with the soil. And here, it's meant to be taken somewhere. Touch your neighbor, tell them, take it to heart. Take it to heart. Air elbow to Jen, take it to heart. Take it somewhere to heart. And it starts with trust. And John had to trust. And if you don't trust something, you're not going to incorporate it to take it further. You have to start with trust. And that takes time to build trust in anything. But John had trust. I don't know about you guys, but I'm better at loving God from a distance. Oh, it's about to get real. Can I be real with y'all? I mean, that's what you guys want, right? Like I'd be a phony pastor if I just told you what you wanted to hear and just everybody high five that said you're good. But that's not, that's not the calling I responded to. I am guilty of loving God 50-50. I've often been guilty of loving God from afar, but not getting close enough to be 100% in with Jesus. You know, is anybody else 50-50 sometimes with their faith? I'm not saying all the time, but maybe we have, you know, hills and valleys in our faith. Growing up, like I said, I was playing in pews. Then there was a period I didn't go to church for a while. And then there was a period I went back to church, and I was, you know, young guy and um, just, you know, trying to be cool. And, uh, you know, like the whole worship thing, like, I don't know about that. Vincent, I've been, I've been raised around some pretty crazy people who like to worship my life, and I still didn't want to worship because I wasn't comfortable. And that's totally cool. And I'm not saying you should do it anyway. Well, you should do it because let me tell you that when I finally did it, it changed my life. And here's why. I've had, I've had pastors grab my arms in church and try to raise them up. I've had another pastor that I've never met be so offended that I wasn't worshiping. And I was a brand new person walking into the building. He, was, he, says, he says, why don't you lift your hands and worship Jesus? And he was big. He was a big man. And I was 21. I'm like, because I don't want to. And I'm just a visitor, so I don't have to listen. No, I didn't do any of that. But I remember walking into that church going, if I've seen that, and I know that's how it can be, if I was someone who'd never been to church, I would never go back. I would never go back to that. And that's why here, we don't do that. We, want, we only stalk you with the connection card, like I've said, but that's the only stalking. I'm kidding. We don't do that because everybody's at a different stage, a different comfort level, and worship does matter. Everybody worships differently. There's no, there's no worship format on how my body has to wor- worship the Lord to be saved, but... Let me tell you what happened. So years went by where I would not worship because I just was at 50-50. I wasn't in, I was at 0-0 for a long time. Then I got into church and I'd go and uh, I went to Cross Point, um, South County Christian Center. Brother Gerald back then. Sean Craig on the keyboards. And that was the first time I was in my 20s. And I remember they had the lights lower than what I was used to, like corporate lights, everybody look at you, the lights were lower, and they were doing this crazy music. It was so out there. It was called Hillsong. And I'm like, what is this demonic Hillsong music? What is this modern stuff? And it's just the best ever. (laughs) 
you, God, for bringing it to my generation. So this is the things that went through my head. Sorry, Pastor Steve. You probably didn't. You're like, why did I come? <laughs> so they're playing Hillsong, and they're worshiping, and there's lots of people, and the lights are low, and I'm like, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. You know, I'm just, I'm breaking the ice. I'm break- Do you know this is surrender? This is, um, I surrender all. We raise our white flag, like on and on, like it's a, a sign of surrender because especially like as a, as a dominant, like, like I don't know, I don't know if women go through this, but men, they're, they're very resistant to, to, to surrender. And so like this feels vulnerable. This is like half vulnerable, Nate, so I was one of these. This arm stuck, it couldn't come, so all these things. And so, so what it was is God needs you to be vulnerable. God needs you to be vulnerable so he can do something with you. It doesn't mean you got to do what the neighbor does. You don't have to copy them. But if you're not sure and you see something you like, go for it as long as it's in the name of the Lord. And it's, it's, it's him, not, not, not Google or something. So what I'm saying is it's a good thing. And it took me all those years of keeping distance to finally go, I need to be closer. This is not, this is just not what I see in the Bible, this way I'm doing it. This is not what I see in the Bible. This is, I was reluctant to get close and I, I had trust issues on what people would think of me. I had trust issues that if I got too far in church, that the worldly people that might be, might be, might be good enough, like I, I gotta find a girl. And if I, don't, if I don't stay connected to the world a little bit, the girls are gonna think I'm weird because I'm this, I'm this church kid, you know? And I was like, all that stuff when you're 20 is like, it's a big deal. And I mean, I was lonely and I was a musician, so I was broke and like all these things. You know, so I'm always going like, what do I do? I can walk the line. I'll walk the line until then I broke the ice. I started the praise. It still took me many more years. And I was even part of other church plants and still didn't like to worship openly. I'm no Vincent, okay? I can't worship like that, but I've come a long ways. Now that I'm 42, I got to, uh, 41, oh Lord, because I'm old too. I can't remember my age. I got to a point where I said, I don't care anymore. I don't care anymore what people think. I gotta go in all, I gotta go all in for Jesus while I have air to breathe and see what God will do. I believe God's gonna do more. And so so the same for you, God's gonna do more. And so we compromise one's faith to love fully because we don't want to give up the thing. And Nolani, you're gonna hate me, but I'm way behind on time. So I'm just gonna preach a little longer. And I'm sorry, but it's a good we took away Nolani's stool today. <laughs> so she's She's going to pray for me. Did I bring back the stool? What's the point of the message here? The point is John did according to what Jesus said because he trusted him. And guess what trust does? It's displayed. I don't have to worry about, is Nate going to show up at 7? It's 45 minutes early. He said he'd be there. He shows up at 7, whether I'm here or not. Vincent, Mike. They show up because trust is displayed. Application displays our trust. You know the phrase, talk is cheap? Can we tell ourselves, talk is cheap? When I go home today, I'm going to look in the mirror and say, talk is cheap. Because God, God, God doesn't want you just to talk. He wants you to live it out. He wants you to speak with your life. Speak with your, your, your heart, which is through your words, which trickles into the life you live. It shows. And you know it, and they know it. And people do see the difference. And this is not a comparison, but people want to see the light of God, not just on Sundays. They don't want, they don't want us, God didn't say be, be with the world and then be Christians on Sunday. God says, you are Christians. You take my light everywhere you go and you exploit darkness. So that's why we do, that's what we do. That's why we put the billboards up because we're, we're shining our light has anybody seen the digital one yet on Highway K? It's on, it's a, we got the picture on there. Michelle's like, don't put the picture. I'm like, we're doing it. The Lord told me. And I said, if not, we can change it real easy because it's digital. So that was our deal. We're shining the light. We're shining the light. Caleb was um, Caleb's my other son, and he's real serious. And he, he's into knitting, crocheting, and evidently there's lots of differences in this whole world of needles and thread. And I just call it all knitting, and they're like, no, it's crocheting and this and that. And so, so we had visited uh, Pastor Wayne Francis uh, last year, and we went to New York and did this thing. And so we, Caleb was going to make him this hat, this uh, scully cap. You know what a scully cap is? Like a woolly knitted hat. And I used to wear them because that was a thing back then. Now it's not cool. 
I still try to wear it. Michelle said, no, that's not cool. You're 41. So anyway, so I used to love the skull cap. So, so he's knitting in the skull cap, and he gets to the very end, and he messes up. And this went on for months, and I'm like, Caleb, is it ever going to be really done? I mean, Pastor Wayne might just go move on to another field by the time this hat is done. I didn't say that to him, but I thought it. And so he gets to the end, and he just bursts out in tears. He burst out in tears because he was so passionate about this hat and being all in for this hat, and he just couldn't get it right. And it was so bad that I had to say, hey, it's okay. I'm just kidding. It's okay. We'll just send him some candy or something. It's all good. It's all good. But his heart shows through his crocheting. His heart shows through his knitting. His heart shows through his wrestling. His heart shows through his hyperventilation when he gets croup every year and has to go throw up on his own because he's gotten so good at it. His heart shows because he demonstrates it. Poor little guy. He's got a little bit of asthma. But we incorporate it, and God wants you to incorporate what he delegates for you to have into your life. It takes incorporation, and John had to take care of Mary, which was probably intimidating, and Mary had to take care of John, which is probably intimidating. When we read it on the paper, it's like, oh, they swapped authority. But let's talk about what really happened. Everybody's who's who's married in here or been married. And when you get married, they 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 say, now you leave your father and mother and you you join, you cleave to your wife, and you become a wife or husband, and you become one flesh, and that's the Bible, and all these things. And and Mary, so so Mary's at the cross, okay? And 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 let's think of it like when we got married, okay? And Jesus, Jesus is delegating now, son, you behold your mother. And and this is like when the baby, me, got married, and there and there my mom's standing there bawling her eyes out because I'm leaving her. Not really, she lives next door, but I'm leaving her household. My brother always said, cut the cord, Jeff. I said, don't be jealous because I'm the baby and I'm a better kid. Cut the cord, Jeff. (laughs) He won't watch this anyway. As a mother, we don't think that Mary might have been actually suffering. Did you know spiritual transactions cost you something? You know it hurts sometimes, Sarah, to grow? It hurts sometimes. You got to face it. It's in the spiritual transactions that you grow. And as bad as I didn't want to upset my mom, I knew I had to be a man and move out and get married because this was now the next chapter of my life. So I didn't love that part. And at the same time, there was joy. There was joy. And Mary's like, okay, my son is no longer going to suffer on this cross, even though I know he is God. I know he's going to be all right, but he's still suffering because he's human hanging on this cross. And so, so there was joy, there was sadness. And then, and then John, he was probably scared. The nurse is gone. The nurse is going to be gone after three days and the veil is going to be torn and then I got to do this? So there was fear, panic, worry, O-M, Lord, O-M-L, oh my Lord, I'm going to make a new one, O-M-L. And and so there was all these things that we don't think about that were happening because they were human too. We lose all that when we just go, oh yeah, they swapped delegation and they, and then Jesus went to the tomb. There's a spiritual transaction that took place in that moment and all over the scripture. And it's in those transactions that God does something wonderful in your life and you finally transition to the next thing. It's a spiritual transaction. And God's love was meant to be taken, taken to heart. And he will give you these spiritual transactions. There are other preachers past, uh, preach about it, they call it the gaps It's the gap. It's that transition window between yesterday's thing and today and tomorrow's situation. Right now, we're in the spiritual transaction of 2020. We don't know what next year looks like yet, and we know what last year looked like, and we're still confused on what is it we're in right now. We're in that foggy transaction period, and God is growing something. When we look back on this video, Cameron, the, the, when we look back on the year-end video, it's going to be a confusing mess to people. It's because it was a spiritual transaction for 1C Church. It was a spiritual transaction for all the church. And it was a spiritual transaction for the lost world who doesn't even know it yet. God's trying to get your attention, somebody. When we incorporate with God, it'll cause us to trade places. Behold your son, behold your mother. When we recognize the transition, we become an extension. 
it wasn't long after, 50 plus days, you know, it was a few days, it was a couple days before he died, so it was a few days before the resurrection, and we know it was 50 days the day of Pentecost when he wrote, when the filling of the Holy Spirit came, and now the church has come to replace him and empowered by the same spirit that dwelleth in him, so now they go, okay, in those 50 days, I wasn't really sure what to think of all this. I'm just looking for a Starbucks and looking for some people to hug me because Jesus left me, you know? And so, and so then the day of Pentecost comes and, and empowers them, and they go, I get it. I get it. Remember when he told me to go preach and don't worry about manuscript? Oh, I get it. I get it. I'm so glad that I stuck with him, that I incorporated with him, that I trusted with him. Because even though I don't get it this year and it looks like a failure, God says the best is yet to come in 2020, in this last quarter. Businesses are starting to do some things. Churches are starting to do some things. People are starting to do some things. So the devil wants you to just sit home and stay the way you've been because he wants you to think that it is the end. And God says it's the beginning. It's a new spiritual transaction. And we're coming in on the other side. Amen. When God equips you to do his will, you have to step into his shoes as the body. Can you imagine having Michael Jordan's real shoes that he handed to you and says, go play for me? Oh, my Lord. Mike, I can't jump. Well, if you got his shoes on, you could. I mean, when I was 5'5 five, five in sixth grade, if I had a Jordan's, I'm sure I could fly. That's what we all thought. But you get Space Jam. You see what I'm saying? Bugs Bunny little Michael Jackson moonwalk in there. Like you just mix it all together. God can do things. You become an extension. We are taking the place and continuing on where God left off. Behold, this is your mission. Behold, if y'all could stand with me this morning. I've talked about extension many times because it's the revelation we have to have. When, we, when I, I'm going to speak to me, and I hope that my life can be a mirror to you, but when I quit looking at church as a thing I do on Sundays and then had the revelation that I am to be an extension of Jesus Christ in the world, it changed everything. I'm going to blow your mind. And then on top of all that, you think, why would he even use me? That's what grace is. Why would God save me? I don't deserve it. Neither do I, neither do we, neither does anybody. So by, gr by grace through faith, we become an extension. Grace allowed it, the door, we walk through it by faith, and we are saying, I'm going to do it. I'm not worthy. Heck no, I'm not worthy. But God, if you want to use me, I believe you because I trust you. I've incorporated with your will, and now I'm going to extend your commission to the world. Even when it's not enough for my neighbor, I don't care what my neighbor thinks. I care what you think, God. We are an extension. Out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth will speak and our lives will walk. God's love was meant to be taken, taken here from the cross into the world as we replace the Messiah as the chosen body of Christ. Touch your neighbor, tell him, you are chosen. You specifically, if you know their name, which you probably do because there's not too many in here right now, you can say you, insert their name, are chosen. It matters because it's personal. It ma oh, God loves all his children. But no, God loves you, Ben. It's personal for you. God loves you, Cindy. It's personal. God didn't die for just Chloe in the world. He died for Cindy. He died for Chloe. Jesus Christ died for Jen. When Jesus was on the cross, he was thinking of Jen. Jen's like, well, how did he know me? Because he created you. That's how he knew. He knows the hairs on your head. You are chosen. And when you take up the mission for real, for God, and say, I'm doing it. That's it. I'm doing it. I don't know how, but I'm going to ask to those who have experienced before me. And I'm going to say, use me because I am clay. God will multiply his house. God will multiply your neighbor who you thought was lost for good and that even God couldn't touch, but God touched you. So now you're going, oh yeah, he touched me when I was a reprobate. And so I guess he could touch my neighbor even though I thought there was no hope. God will do it through you. If you trust him, you incorporate and you extend Jesus Christ to the world. It's that easy. 
It's not complicated. They were fishermen. They weren't accountants. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. They were publicans, sinners. They were just normal people that changed the world. And I believe, church, that we can change the world. That what we see right here is just a crumb on the surface of what the church will be at 1C Church and in the, in the church as a whole. But God commissioned me to lead this church, and I believe that you're just seeing a fraction, and it will blow your mind what God will do if we go all in. I promise you, you will see things blow up for his kingdom because I've seen it before and he never stops delivering on his promise all in everybody say it I'm all in I'm all in I'm all in God we're all in and we're going to give thanks right now that we have this opportunity to be in your house and be all in for something that is so pure and something that is so authentic and transparent and genuine to the world that is caught up, caught up in the politics but we didn't come to be PC God we came to be real with people in their hearts and give them the word and not shy away from your gospel not shy away from the scriptures but just give it to them God that you are the judge we don't need to judge nobody we we welcome everybody at 1c church we want you to come here so you can hear the word and god can give the increase and till your soil and you'll be shouting like us in a year because god's gonna shake up your life and do something good because we've seen it before and we'll see it again and as long as the, the rapture has not come yet god is gonna keep delivering people and growing his church and god we know that a healthy church is a growing church we weren't we weren't meant to stay a few crumbs on the table god we're creating a feast for the world. So God, if people don't want us to grow, they don't know that we were meant to go out and deliver the good news and reach the ends of the earth. So that's what we're going to keep doing. Whether the neighbor recognizes it, we know in time they will recognize it because one plants, one waters, and only you, God, can give the increase. God, keep your hand on this week as we go about. And we're going to end in worship and give some praise to you because we know what you have done. And we give so much thanks, God, that you spared us like a fragmented little leaf off a tree. You spared us like that leaf, God, that had no value left. And you gave us new spring up welling of water that gave us new life, God, and new root. And we are ready, God, to go all in for you. And if the house of God can say, in Jesus' name, amen.